Welcome everyone to Lunch with Lori, where I schedule time with leaders in our industry to hear how they're navigating their career and their perspectives on leadership, what's going on in the world. And the goal is to pique your interest and really challenge your thinking. Today, my guest is founder and CEO, Dr. Sophia Ananye Anya, a Nigerian American millennial female STEM entrepreneur. She is a former Pfizer scientist and Yale trained molecular oncologist. And she's currently the founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm. And she utilizes a really multidisciplinary background with really diverse experience um, in therapeutic areas. And she advises her clients who are in the life science industry on strategic marketing, social media, and corporate communication. And the goal is to amplify scientific innovation. What a wonderful focus to have in your career. Now, she hosts the Amplifying Scientific Innovation podcast, where she interviews CEOs and senior execs in biotech and big pharma on their unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. She's a recipient of numerous honors and awards, and uh, let me tell you, a stellar academic lineage with a BS in biochemistry, master's in public health administration, MBA in healthcare administration, PhD in medicinal chemistry, a postdoc fellowship in medical oncology at Yale, um, and she's peer-reviewed nine public has nine peer-reviewed publications and a patent. Oh my goodness! Hello, Sophia, and welcome to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am so pleased. I know we had a lot of snow out there, so we're tucked away in our offices for our lunch. And um, since many people listen to us over lunch, I enjoy opening the conversation with a critical question about what's for lunch. So as you're originally from Nigeria, if you were there now, what would be on the lunch menu? You know, every African knows this and they can argue if they want, but Nigerians make the best jollof rice, okay? And I am a mistress of jollof rice making. And so for lunch today, you'll find this beautiful bowl of jollof rice, which I should have brought with me, but, you know, we'll save that for another episode. Okay. Um, and it's uh, jollof rice, just uh, uh, it's just rice that has uh, tomatoes and very... Uh, fragrant uh, spices in it. And uh, it's just something that we truly enjoy. And it's part of that West African culture that no matter where you go in the world, you always go back home. And lunch today is jollof rice. Oh, and it, it just makes me feel warm right now. So what a great, I feel like I can smell the spices. Uh, I, I had the great pleasure to, to meet you um, at an in-person HBA event when I interviewed Pfizer CEO, Albert Borla. Um, I think that was back in 2019 and in those lazy, hazy days before COVID and, and we've kept in touch and I'm really honored to bring you into the lives of other HBA members. So why don't we dig in and, and hear a bit more about you? Um, so Sophia, you own your own company and that is something mm -hmm. that many women I speak to dream of. Um, mm -hmm. But you had a different career path prior yeah. to this entrepreneur that you are today. So perhaps as a way to, for the audience to get to know you, it would be great if you could share the highlights of your journey from Nigeria to now. Great, uh, great question, Laurie. Um, so I was born in Nigeria and for me, I've had this passion, this massive intellectual curiosity and I spent the bulk of my preteen years uh, reading the Encyclopedia Britannica for fun. But what was different for me is growing up in a society, male dominated society that had a very traditional idea of what women should be. I sort of didn't have enough support early enough in my career. Um, and I didn't actually get to go to college until I came to the US because there was just this opposition to this fascination that I had with the sciences. But when I came to the US, though, I said I was going to get educated and nothing or no one could stop me. And it's not easy. I think that not enough is said about the immigrant story from the perspective of having the passion, the desire to do something, but also having societal sort of setbacks that keep you from being exactly who you want to be. But I knew that education was going to be my emancipation 
Mm-hmm. I believe that till today that knowledge is power. And I said that if I could sort of showcase my academic brilliance, it might open up doors for me to really sort of demonstrate what I've always wanted to do, which you rightfully identified as amplifying scientific innovation. I just didn't have the same level of articulation, clarity, and confidence that I have today. Um, and it, it, of course, it takes time. You have to have a diversity of experiences. I, I worked for Pfizer very briefly, but very important importantly, early on in my career. And uh, when you come from Nigeria, you live in Ohio, and you hear that you're moving to Connecticut, you get so excited. And so I, as a lab scientist, I just didn't see my career going too far. I felt that I needed to get some kind of subject matter expertise. And I've always been fascinated by oncology just because of how difficult it is for us to understand and treat cancers. And so my PhD and, and my postdoctoral work was really in, in molecular oncology. I've, I've studied so many different cancer cells in the labs and trying to figure out what types of drug uh, combinations will be able to sort of kill the most cancer cells. And that work, as you mentioned, led to a patent and multiple publications. But ultimately, what I found within myself was as much as I love science, I hated being in the lab. I mean, we've met, Laurie. I, I like people. I like sort of, you know, uh, being around people. I get so much energy from that. Um, and I also realized that I had a different type of skill set, the ability to articulate the clinical and economic value of a drug uh, to a diverse audience. So I know how to speak to a scientist and a non-scientist. And, and so I, I went ahead and I got my MBA. Uh, my mom was not too pleased at this one. It's like, how much more educated are you going to get? Um, and I'm glad that I did that because I said I consulting lived in different parts of the country from Portland, Maine to San Diego, California. And New York City is where I came about three, almost getting close to four years now. And I found so much joy, so much success, so much opportunity here, which is why I stayed on. And after sort of consulting all the way to, you know, extremely uh, senior positions in other consulting firms, I felt the need and the desire to do exactly what it is that gets me the most excited, which as I mentioned is amplifying scientific innovation. And obviously over the course of our conversation, I'll fill in the blanks and sort of my entrepreneurial journey. It's not an easy one, but it's one that has brought me incredible joy. And I've been able to meet incredible people like you, Laurie, through my relationship with the HBA. But most recently I I was a selected to join the inaugural class of the EY Entrepreneurs Access Network, which is designed specifically to help Black and Latinx uh, businesses to scale. Um, And, you know, that's the beginning of many great things. And at some point, of course, I'll drop some hints about my, my Amplifying Scientific Innovation podcast. But to summarize my story, it's one that is driven by a passion for science, um, <clears throat> resiliency, and and just the desire and, and belief in building relationships with people. Oh, Sophia, your uh, your passion and your confidence uh, just exudes and jumps off the screen um, at me. And you're doing some really good, great work um, in that making science more accessible. And and we know now today we are trying to help the public to understand. Um, the science around vaccines, and so they're not afraid and they can make good decisions. Um, So my question to you is, you've been building your business and having so many successes. What was the best advice you received? Um, You know, I think it was my first day at Yale and I I, my, my, my postdoctoral advisor was the chief of breast medical oncology, and it still is at, at the Yale Cancer Center, Dr. Lajos uh, Pushtai. And he said to me that I shouldn't be intimidated um, because I'm going to meet a lot of talented people, obviously, right? And But I should understand that the reason why I was selected to be part of the uh, Yale uh, postdoctoral program was because I had the talent and I had the skill set to do that. And, you know, it's interesting because um, much of my life has been about sort of proving that I, I what I want to do makes sense. Like, I'm, why do you want to be a scientist? There are easier things that you could do. 
And at some point, my dad told me I was wasting my looks. And so it's been sort of this conflict between who I am and who people want me to be. And for this man to recognize that and to say to me, like, don't be afraid to, to go out there and to be yourself. And it just sort of allowed me the wings to fly as high as I can and, and to believe that, you know, People are people. I respect people. And, and obviously, I have that, uh, my, my podcast where I interview senior leaders like yourself, Laurie, like Dr. Michelle McMurray Hith, who is the president and CEO of BIO, um, the largest trade association in the world. And so, there are different people that I bring on, but that sort of fearlessness. Um, to respect people for who they are and for their accomplishments, but to not allow myself to be intimidated by that either, because in some ways I, I also have my own sort of thought leadership to bring to the table. So I think it's important when we have managers and sponsors and things of that nature for people to encourage you to be the best that you can be and to not try to hold you back, especially if you've been like myself that much of your life, it's been like, hey, don't do this. And it's like, you're always trying to prove yourself. And I think I'm finally in a place of peace within myself where I know who I am, I know what I want to do, but perhaps most importantly, I know that what I want to do has an impact. It's about sort of increasing accessibility to credible science and to show people that scientists are, are humans, right? People in the life science industry, people in the healthcare industry, they're humans too, and everything else after that. And, and I love the way you're framing that and sometimes possibly even reframing it. So you have the confidence, you go back to that mentor who gave you that advice, you can pull from that. You know, if you're ever in that place where you're you're thinking, oh, you know, should I be here? And and as mentors, we should encourage our mentees all the time. Yes. If you were in a meeting, you got invited to that meeting for a reason, you need to speak up, you need to contribute. So I love that advice. Um, and, um, and I did see that um, CEO of Bio um, uh, show that you did on your podcast. It was excellent. So I encourage people to, to watch that. Um, what an incredible um, uh, other female uh, to join our community. So um, on the other side of the coin, uh, what was the worst advice you were given? Uh, it was the opposite of the advice that I just shared with you. And it happened fairly recently. Names will not be revealed. But last year, I had a very unfortunate meeting with, uh, an, I guess, an investor that I was quite eager to partner with. And he told me that people are going to be intimidated intimidated by my education. So he said I should pull out the PhD from sort of my title. I shouldn't mention that I did a, a postdoctoral training at Yale. I should just present myself as sort of meekly as possible. And it's interesting because I don't know, I know, Laurie, I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal piece over this past weekend that was ask, asking Dr. Jill Biden to drop the doctor from, from her title. And it, it's, I don't know why we live in a society and it's, it's disappointing for me in many ways because part of the reason why I came to America is I was hoping that here things would be a lot easier for women that we would be respected for who we are and that if you're an accomplished woman that you should be celebrated and you shouldn't be asked to sort of diminish yourself so that other people will feel comfortable and and, and that's really something and i tweeted about it. it's probably one of my more sort of popular tweets but this idea that we have to shrink ourselves to make people comfortable especially for women of color and i'm like but but why do i have to do that if i if i got educated and i spent over 15 16 years of, of my life after high school getting educated and trained should i sort of pretend that that didn't happen uh, i mean it's just interesting to me well <laughs> i think you're right to point out the dr joe biden and and you know to to drop the doctor that that's just ridiculous and and i would put myself um out there to say i doubt very much that that would be the advice if you were a, a male um I, so I it was because you were a woman i i, I agree do. with you Exactly. And, and I think that one of the reasons why I appreciate the HBA is this idea of, you know, gender parity and truly making an impact. And if we do not speak up about the things that matter, if we do not amplify our voice, as so was the theme for this uh, past conference, I think that we miss out on key opportunities to elevate. And, and you know, the, the, the saying that women who are silent never make history, or women who do exactly as they're told never make history. And, and part of the 
reason why I came to this country. And I could spend one whole day talking about sort of the challenges that I faced, but I am such an optimistic, um, can do person that I choose to sort of focus more on the positive part. But one of the things that I will continue to stand up for is for increased representation of women in, in senior positions. And especially if those women actually happen to be women of color, black women in particular, who often struggle to be seen or to be heard and oftentimes pursue entrepreneurship at a much earlier stage than many others, because for some reason being accepted for who they are continues to be a challenge. And that's why I'm really proud of of Ernst & Young for this Entrepreneurs Access Network program that they developed uh, this year. And part of the reason probably was as a response to sort of what we continue to see as the challenges with structural and institutional racism in the US, right? So right. I think there's so many challenges that people like myself face because you're a double minority in, in many ways. And for mm -hmm. me, I'm probably a triple or quadruple minority. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, you're right, Sophia, and it's and it's a whole topic of intersectionality. We could we could have another lunch and learn on 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 this one. But what I'm so pleased is that you you have a voice. You yeah. leverage your voice. You understand the importance of it. And have you always been that way, or do you sort of remember a time as you were growing up when you realized you had a voice and and why it was important to use it? Well, I'm the youngest of five, so I learned, and I have three older brothers, right? So I learned quite early that if I don't use that voice, my brothers will pretty much just spank, smack me over the head every day. Not that they did that, but, it, you know, I think growing up with brothers uh, made me sort of recognize my voice early. But perhaps more importantly, I went to a boarding school for five years of my life in, in Nigeria, and, and that's like, you know, I guess in America, it'll be seventh grade uh, through 12th grade I was in, in school um, and to sort of be by yourself at 10 years and 11 years uh, it's just in an isolated area of the country I became very focused on, on again getting educated and one of the things they recognized in my boarding school was my ability to communicate and to communicate fairly quickly so I became the head girl of my school and so that means that when commissioners and governors, and I, I don't think the president of the country ever came to my school, but whenever we had dignitaries that were coming to visit, I'll be called upon to give a speech um, on behalf of other students. So I learned how to think fairly quickly on, on top of my feet. But when I became a scientist, um, it became a bit more challenging because scientific communications is, of course, more tricky. But I decided that if I took that flair, that passion that I, ha I had for communicating with people and, and combined it with sort of my detail-oriented nature when it comes to science and that I could find a way to make it interesting and that I could broaden the conversation so it's not about mechanisms of action or things that ultimately don't really matter but to come down to one thing that remains important to me which is impact the things that we do how does it impact people's lives so it's, it's been a journey across multiple continents but it's one that came about because i learned fairly early how to stand up for myself having brothers mm -hmm. but i took it to another level by learning how to speak for other people as the head girl of my school and and today i've learned how to sort of in some ways represent an industry that is not often the most transparent by sort of opening up the, the, the back door so that people will see behind the scenes what it really takes to be a leader and hopefully to continue to touch people's lives all over the world. And I've been fortunate that I have uh, an audience from Asia all the way to Africa that will wow. tune in to, to listen to what's happening on the podcast. Well, you did have an audience at the this year's HBA <laughs> conference because you did, um, a, a session, a workshop for us, yeah. and you were looking at the health technology in a post-COVID-19 future. So I'm interested um, now with the vaccine, et cetera, what you're anticipating that 2021 looks like for, for our industry and, and, and hopefully, you know, more of that, that time when we're managing the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, great point. One of the questions that I was asked was, when do we get back to the new normal? Oh, sorry, the old normal. And I I just said, for me, maybe being born in a place that we didn't have a lot, I've learned how to be grateful 
Um, and I think sometimes that gets lost on us because we are, it's so easy to crave for what we had, nostalgia. You think about the ease at which we used to go to restaurants and things of that nature. But, you know, I've always had a consciousness around infectious disease. And that's because growing up in Nigeria, I knew that every 45 seconds or so in Africa, a child dies from malaria. But because that doesn't happen here in the US, people don't often say too much about that. So what we can anticipate for 2021, it's it's a shift in consciousness. It's something, COVID-19 happened and it's not something we can pretend that did not happen. I think we're all going to be somewhat more health conscious right? Uh, somewhat less uh, willing to go to crowded places all the time, somewhat more uh, sort of aware of when you go to restaurants that the proper hygiene me measures are, are being used. Just overall, uh, that sort of heightened consciousness of our mortality, our morbidity, but also our awareness that infectious diseases do happen. And I know we often talk about cancers and, and obviously that's what my background is in and other chronic diseases. Not to say that that's not important, but I think hopefully on sort of a macro scale, even as we think about investment dollars, that we would have more monies being invested in technologies like AI and, and machine learning that would help us to improve our predictive analysis, right? So they can, we can get one, one step in front of the eight ball, as, as they will say. Um, but overall, I think that vaccines, for some reason, became a controversial topic in the US over the past decade. And now that we've had great people like Dr. Fauci come in front of several TV screens, big and small, to really talk about the importance of vaccination and herd immunity and, and just sort of us as a society be more conscious of our health and, and sort of protecting ourselves so that we can protect other people. That will probably be the biggest takeaway. And you know, sooner or later we'll get back to traveling, et cetera. But that's sort of where we are now. I, I think you know you've made it when you've been on Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> um, uh, um, and you know, I do, I do think people like to think back on what things were like. And when we are post-pandemic and we have resumed some semblance of, you know, not having to be six feet away and wearing masks continuously, we will probably think back to these days. Um, uh, so, you know, it's just, it's the way um, our human condition works. But uh, um, it, you have been such a dedicated HBA member and volunteer leader. I'm currently the president of the New York Chapter Board of Dir Directors. What is it about the HBA that attracts you to this community? You know, I think it's a sense of acceptance. Um, I never had to be anybody but myself or the HBA and sort of the the diversity of experience that I bring in is something that was appreciated. And I, I've never had an organization that was so appreciative of volunteering. To me, those things I would do it anyway, but to be recognized for, for twice with a SPAC award, to get a, a mentor award recognition, to mm -hmm. have an opportunity to even have this chat with you, Laurie, uh, too many times in, in sort of these professional organizations, you you just do it because, you know, let me just try it out. But with the HBA, it's just, it's different. It's just about that sense of acceptance with like-minded women who, who will do anything for the people within the community, who really care about the issues that matter. Michael O'Brien did an excellent job with the New York City chapter, and that's probably the New York chapter, that's probably one of the reasons why I was fascinated by the role itself. And I stepped up, I volunteered myself. And even when I met you, I was a volunteer at the registration desk, mm -hmm. handing badges, right? So to me, there is no job too big or too small. But what's amazing about the HBA is the focus on empowering women, different types of women with from mm -hmm. different different parts of the world. And I do think that one of the great things that came out of 2020 was this idea of globalization and where you get to partner with chapters um, 
from different parts of the US and also different parts of the world. I think the possibilities are endless and the people are amazing. This is why I love the HBA. And, and you're so right about that. I mean, we can um, you know, participate in, in um, the Paris chapter event and the, you know, the next day participate with the, with the Miami uh, folks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just really pretty um, amazing how the, you know, one of the benefits that has come out of COVID has helped us to see what a global world it is and how we benefit from hearing from others. But, you know, with all of this, it does bring stress. I mean, 2020 has been incredibly stressful. So what, what have you found um, that helps you manage your stress? Um, you look so beautifully healthy. <laughs> so what are you doing that helps you be your best self? Well, thank you, Laurie. You look amazing too. Um, I believe in self-care. Um, it's funny because one of the things I prioritized at the beginning of the year, not even knowing how all of this will pan out, was self-care. I think too often as women, obviously we play different roles, caregivers, wives, mothers, daughters, cousins, etc. But I do think that the, the most important relationship you have is the relationship that you have with yourself. And because if you're at peace with yourself, if, if there's sort of balance within, then you can be the best, insert any title in there. But it starts first with you. And so for me, I think the number one thing that I really do prioritize is sleep. I, I need sleep. It's the only way I can completely recharge my batteries. I like to drink lots of water. I like to watch a uh, crappy, um, sorry. I like to watch some reality TV show. Some people might not really think it's the best, but it makes me laugh. And, and I think having a good laugh uh, is something that is so great, but most importantly, the whole point of self-care for me, it's about renewing and refreshing so that you can be the best person that you can be. And however you choose to do that, whether it's yoga, whether it's you know uh, exercise or long walks on the beach is up to you. But I find that sustainable sources, so things that I can do regardless of what the weather might be or regardless of where I'll be in the world. And, and to me, it just starts with making sure that I'm okay and, and, and just be, that sort of mindfulness and combining that with making sure that I get plenty of sleep and perhaps most importantly, building relationships with people that energize me. I think it's important to be very careful about who we choose to spend our times with because if you're around the sort of people that drain you constantly, sooner or later, no matter how strong you think you might be, it will start to affect you. So it starts with you, take care of you, uh, regardless of what's going on in the world. It's a difficult time, but you know, find find the you within you because it's going to evolve, it's going to change. And uh, you have to be brave enough to allow yourself to sort of uh, adapt to changing circumstances and to adopt that spirit of gratitude that I think it's so important um, to have. Now I know why I like being around you. That's exactly what I, I, everything you listed was what I do as well, because you want to be positive and, and have energy and be around other people with energy. And it just, you know, brings you um, and lifts you up and lifts those around you. So thank you so much for spending your lunch break with me, Sophia. It was it's such a wonderful treat for me. It's my absolute pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm so proud of you personally, professionally. I think that you took the HBA to a new level the moment you joined in and you continue to empower each and every one of us to be the best that we can be. It starts with you and, and if the HBA is a great organization it's because we have an amazing CEO. So thank you for yeah. all you do. Thank you, Sophia. You are so kind. And please join me next month uh, when I will be chatting with David Batchelor from Syntegrity. Um, he works with company executives across industries to create solutions to really complex problems. He is an expert facilitator and I have learned so much from him and I think you will too. So this has been Lunch with Laurie. I hope this was nourishment that refueled your leadership tank. Until next time, Bon Appetit.